thank you uh, firstly for inviting me to come and talk tonight, um, but also everyone turning up. It is an intimidating large audience, so I'm going to stop looking at that number on the screen. Um, so, I, as, as John said, I am an emergency physician and a, a neurointensivist and trauma intensivist in Cambridge, um, but I also do research in traumatic brain injury. Um, and it's really been a little bit like Christmas this year for head injury um, in the UK for guidelines. Um, so we've had the nice head injury um, update, but we've also had the concussion guidelines that have come out. And so if there was time towards the end, I was going to touch just on those because I think they do interact as, as guidelines. Um, in terms of uh, declarations of interest, I should um, say that I've been on both the NICE Head Injury Guideline Update Committee, um, but also on uh, behalf of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, I also uh, took part in the UK Concussion Guidelines, um, and I also hold a grant with Roche, but I won't be talking about biomarkers today, so it has nothing to do with this talk. Um, so why is head injury important? Uh, well, in the in England and Wales alone, more than 600,000 people attend emergency departments every year. Um, and, uh, you know, that's around the world. Um, that's sort of quite a large number of people who have a head injury. Um, and these guidelines, they don't focus on the chronic care of patients after head injury. They really focus on that hyperacute stage of assessing people and managing Um, and so this is the actual uh, recommendation in the guideline itself. And you can see that there is a uh, dose um, change for, for people under the age of 16. So 15 milligrams to 30 milligrams up to a maximum of two gram IV bolus. Um, the uh, two gram IV bolus, as I said, was used in the RAL trial. And it was also discussed with the, the BNF and in reality, use of TXA in both trauma and traumatic brain injury is off-label, um, and the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of the drug mean that that two-gram bolus is uh, a perfectly acceptable way to give it. But what does TXA do? So we all think about TXA as working within the coagulation cascade and sort of potentially stopping bleeding, but there's actually a lot more to tranexamic acid than just that. So uh, it actually has quite an influence on inflammation after trauma. Um, and so this is, I'm not going to go through all this slide, um, particularly in the uh, time that I've got, but it's just to show that it does have an effect on inflammation. And also uh, TXA uh, appears to have an effect um, on uh, sort of your metabolism and oxygen utilisation via the mitochondria. And why is that important? Well, it does appear that TXA seems to work differently in patients who have a traumatic brain injury compared to, to those who might have extracranial injury or other forms of bleeding. Um, and indeed, the RAL trial uh, and CRASH suggests that that one gram bolus and one gram over eight hours might be less effective in those patients who have an intracranial injury compa when compared to those patients who have suspected extracranial injury. Now, why might this be the case? Well, you can get disruption of your blood brain barrier if you've got intracranial bleeding. And so it might be that you need that higher dose of TXA to target that hyperfibrinolysis. Um, so that two gram bolus might be more effective because of that. Um, but you also get this very complex cascade that A significant change in the guidelines. So there's been uh, a, a, a raising of awareness of pituitary dysfunction after traumatic brain injury. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that um, it's well recognised that it does cause significant morbidity and mortality. Um, and so if you look at what happens to people who have pituitary dysfunction, many of those symptoms and signs, such as fatigue, headache, dizziness, uh, lethargy, depression, uh, may actually also occur in a head injury itself. And so this means that pituitary dysfunction is often often missed. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, this was really to wait, raise awareness that if patients in the more chronic phase have any of the signs and symptoms here, 
including not just those associated with the head injury, but also excessive thirst, uh, hypotension, hyponatremia, for example, then they really should be consideration of having either investigations or referral to an endocrinologist to investigate for hypopituitism. Now, the evidence on this is very uh, low quality evidence, um, and so clearly more evidence does need to, to be gathered. Um, now, after you've had a traumatic event, then cortisol levels uh, do change quite markedly and do rise. Um, and so in that acute phase after a head injury, so when patients present to the emergency department um, or on, during the uh, initial phase of their admission to hospital, checking for pituitary dysfunction um, is not appropriate. Um, so this is a, a bit more of a chronic phase. Um, and so, uh, as I said, this is really to try and raise awareness um, so that so that we can either gather more evidence for this, but also that patients don't have uh, hyperpituitarism missed. Function in those patients that you see out of the acute phase of a head injury who are having ongoing problems. Um, and uh, for those patients who have um, persisting problem, symptoms after a head injury, no matter what severity it is, then please do uh, consider referring them to appropriate clinicians or a multidisciplinary team. Um, the NICE guidelines themselves are, are quite bulky, um, but you know are, are definitely worth reading if you're looking after patients with a traumatic brain injury. Um, but there's also been a um, just uh, very recently published uh, this summary um, of the updated guidelines in the BMJ, um, and it's actually quite an easy read and very well done. And so I would uh, highly recommend going to the BMJ and, and looking this up. So now I was just going to touch on the concussion guidelines before um, opening it up to the floor so that we could sort of talk about more things, head injury. Um, so uh, these guidelines were actually released in uh, April, so a couple of months ago, um, and they are for non-elite grassroots sport. And I think they're really important, not only because they give guidance for, oops, for patients who uh, may have had a concussion, and I'm using concussion in the, in the sense of um, that that really is applying to sports related uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, that, but they're important for the fact that these guidelines actually have buy-in from most of the sporting bodies within the UK, and that's a, a no uh, mean feat. Um, and they're also, the, uh, to our knowledge, the first uh, national, truly national guidelines um, in the world for concussion. And so they're, they're a, a really important um, way to make sports safer because you know, we don't want to stop sport, but we do want to make it, make it safe. To give patients it's appropriate about whether or not they should turn up to acute services or their GP or other. Um, and there's also an ongoing audit process to make sure that 111 is not being overwhelmed by this new guidance. Um, but then if you've got someone who has had a concussion and you've assessed whether or not they need to have a head CT or any other acute management, what kind of advice should we give them? So the current best advice is for a graded return to work and sport. And I think that this probably um, is good advice to just give someone with a mild head injury in general as well. And so it's really relative rest for the first 24, 48 hours with minimized uh, screen time and perhaps some gentle exercise. Um, and I think the minimized screen time is important to point out as there is actually some good evidence that particularly in adolescents, if you take away their uh, social media, so you take away their smartphones and so on, it actually greatly worsens their symptoms of their concussion or their mild head injury. Um, and so it's really about minimizing that time rather than depriving them and allowing them to go into withdrawal. And then it's a, gra a graded return to their normal activities. And so it gives here sort of a, gra a gradual introduction to your daily activities and then going through and increasing what you do at each of these stages. Now, each of these stages should take at least sort of 48 hours or so. And if symptoms get worse, if patients end up moving on to the next stage, then they should go back to the previous stage. Um, and in order to return to full training for sport, 
then um, the guidelines say that patients need to be symptom free at rest for 14 days before they should consider 14 training and that they shouldn't return to sports competition before day 21, as long as they've been symptom free at rest for 14 days. So it could be longer than 21 days. That's really the minimum. Um, and uh, if patients or the, the uh, people have symptoms for more than 28 days, um, then they should be referred on for a formal assessment by a healthcare uh, professional, um, for example, GP or, or other appropriate person. Um, and so this has really been a big change in terms of, of how long people should stay off sport, but it's a, I guess it's a, a, a compromise between trying to make sport safe, um, but also make it still enjoyable so people can take part in it. Um, so uh, I guess that's been quite a quick tour of the two big guidelines that have come out for head injury.